Hello everyone, my name is Kelly Selden and I'm on the uh, MRC Light Core team along with Nathan and Jake. Uh, this, this is a talk called The World of Ember Macros and How to Create Your Own. Alright, the agenda. This talk is broken into three parts. Why should I use a macro? Using pre-made macros and making your own macros. Where does your logic go? Now, when I say logic, I don't mean action code or member functions. I mean property building, like Booleans for toggling content and arrays for generating lists. Uh, your options are in your template, and uh, here are a few add-ons that will help you along that road, the most popular ones, I would say. Uh, a lot of you may already be familiar with these, or in your JavaScript. And uh, here's a few options, maybe less familiar to you. Uh, this was borrowed from another talk on logic and templates. Uh, it's an example of what you can do with template helpers. Uh, it's very powerful, uh, but also very confusing. I can't figure out what conditions my content is showing. Uh, I could spend time staring at this to figure it out, uh, but that shouldn't be required to view your presentation layer. Content uh, should read very clearly and fluidly with the logic abstracted away from you. Here's how I would write this. Uh, I would move all the logic and object building to JavaScript and only expose meaningful properties that will help me read the template clearly. Here's what the JavaScript becomes. Uh, I ported the template helpers as one-to-one -one as possible. Uh, or you could write it something like this to make it easier to follow the variable changes. Uh, Chrome and now VS Code uh, will put the variable values on the end of the line for you when you're debugging. So this might be a lot easier for you. Um, this topic is explored in more depth by Marco from Simple Labs, uh, where I got that awesome little example he made to prove a point. Uh, go check it out if you want to know more about uh, pros and cons of each. But I just want to brief over that. Uh, so after that brief explanation of where logic can, can or should go, uh, let's talk about tools uh, to make putting logic in your JavaScript easier. So what is a macro? It's a Ember computer, Ember computer property macros use dependent properties to lazily compute a value. This value is cached for subsequent lookups and recalculated when the dependent properties change. Uh, this is the only definition I'll be reading in the whole presentation, I promise. All right, macros in action. Uh, this is the prior art, uh, the grandfather of macros. That's uh, Ember CPM. Uh, it's been stable for years, but it hasn't had many additions at all. And Ember Awesome Macros is something I've been working on. Uh, I started it as basically a dumping ground for macros uh, that I couldn't find uh, in Ember CPM, uh, but it's grown to be a pretty complete set of macros for everyday Ember development. And like template composing, it looks a lot like Lisp programming. Um, now before I dive into the structure of a macro, I want to give some examples of the benefits you get over regular computer properties. In this case, we have plain old code reduction. Your references to each variable goes from two to one. And you get rid of the function and the this.get. No more temporary properties. Uh, I used to write code like this, where you would have to make a computer property for no other reason but to chain it for another computer property. Uh, makes side effects impossible. Sometimes a set would sneak into a computer getter, uh, which is a bad practice. Uh, programming with macros doesn't suffer from this problem because they're essentially pure functions. 
reduces bugs waiting to happen. Uh, it's a little hard to spot at first glance, but you can see there are two missing properties in the watching list that are used in the calculation on top. Uh, it's uh, the second line should fetch replies, and on the last one, on the left, there's next offset. It's hard to miss. I mean, it's hard to, uh, it's easy to miss these, uh, these properties used in the calculation, but not being watched. Uh, as you can see, just the process of converting them mac to macros in an existing code base will fix bugs or uh, potential bugs. This one has an extra property in its watch list, potentially causing extra calculations for no reason. Since the values used in the calculation don't use that extra property, there's no way if you would uh, calculate a different value when the extra property changes. If the calculation is intensive, this bug can prove costly. In this case, you're using an array but not watching the array property for length changes. As objects are pushed to and pop from the array, the value becomes stagnant and the property never recalculates unless the array is reassigned. Uh, the bottom macro needs the length on the right uh, and as a result will update on length changes. So let's explain the concepts. There's a couple of mental hurdles. This is the simplest case. String keys that map to property values on the object. These are how the existing ember.computed macros are set up, so there's not much of a surprise. What else can you put in there? On the left, you have a value instead of a key. And on the right, you have an object instead of a key. So you can see that you can put pretty much whatever you want in there, it doesn't care. Uh, what if you want to use a string value? So this will look up a property with the name of Kelly on the object instead of using the actual string value. So how do you fix it? We have an escaping system here. We import raw from Ember macro helpers and now we can treat strings as values instead of keys. So this is uh, one of two primitives that come from the base library, Ember, Ma Ember Macro Helpers, uh, that we need for a complete experience. Uh, the reason they're special and come from this uh, base library is because they're shared across other macro libraries. All the array of ma macros know that the first param is going to resolve to an array. So they automatically watch for length changes for you. Uh, you don't need the dot bracket bracket in the bottom. It does that for you. <coughs> property brace expansion. Uh, this is an underutilized feature of Ember computer properties in my opinion. Uh, but these macros have full support for it. Uh, because of the primitives used, the macros don't care how you supply the values. Here you can see some more examples of how you might use this. Single key, single string key, but equals to uh, using multiple values in the macro. Bottom one's just e equating three values for you. Uh, <clears throat> this is a new uh, ES6 feature called tagged template literals. Uh, the tag is a macro. And the interpolations can be macros too. And the interpolations are uh, the variable lookups in the middle. This is real JavaScript running in the middle. Uh, it's not running eval or anything hacky. Uh, so uh, you could put anything that you want in there. You could imagine this could be pretty verbose if you were uh, using computer properties. Uh, Now, if the syntax of this macro, um, oh, excuse me, it, uh, here's a, another example down here, uh, a real world, real world scenario of building a string uh, using macros. Now, if the syntax of this macro looks a little weird to you, 
Uh, you can think of it as the same technology that goes into component tests. Here's the default component integration test. Uh, it also uses a tag template literal to compile your template syntax. Uh, I just figured it would be helpful uh, to make that correlation if you didn't know about it. Uh, the macros are read only on purpose, which means trying to set the property gives you a read only error. The existing macros don't have this problem by default. They let you set the property to replace the computer property with any old value. Uh, the value will never recalculate after that point. You can make one of the existing macros read only by applying a dot read only modifier. This is actually a little known best practice. Now why read only macros you might ask? Uh, the best answer is in the same vein as why data down actions up and not two way binding. Uh, the answer is to protect you from yourself. Uh, like two way binding it's very easy to make a mistake or set yourself up for a weird state or configuration issue uh, if, after the page has received a lot of interaction in state change. When looking at your computer property, you don't know whether it's still an actual computer property or someone came along and replaced it with something else. It could be a major headache when debugging. Uh, here's a quote from Stephen Penner, uh, a core team member with insight as to why I went with read-only macros. And I'm not going to be reading this one, I promised. That means that, unfortunately, you cannot blindly convert computer properties to this new style. Uh, in this example, I want to go through and convert all my computer properties to macros where possible. Uh, this one happens to have a set on it, but I might not have noticed. And after I convert it, at some point, uh, when running the app, I start getting errors. In order to get that setting capability back, uh, you now have to opt in to writable instead of opting in to read only. Uh, this is the second primitive I was referring to in Ember Macro Helpers. It allows you to continue converting all your properties to macros without making you refactor every set you come across. It's a big win for readability because you can now see at a glance what properties are immutable or not. Here is the buzzword of composing, uh, what makes macros so powerful. Composing can go as far and as deep as you want, which is to say until it gets too hard to read and reason. Caveats. You lose the ability to set a breakpoint or add a debugger statement. The below is how you could de deconstruct a macro that got too confusing. Uh, to place a debugger call. Uh, complex macros, like most syntax sugar, has the all too common trade-off uh, where it gets starts to get too confusing and you need to go back to the old-fashioned JavaScript. Um, I'm thinking of adding a debug macro that you can throw in to get a breakpoint to hit at that point in the macro tree, um, but I'm hesitant to add it at this point because Ember CLI doesn't have tree shaking built in yet and I don't want this to be in everyone's production payload. Uh, so there's still some experimentation left to do with this. All right, before I end this section, I want to brief over some implementation detail uh, that will excite at least one person in the audience, Nathan. Uh, I wanted a macro for every math object function. Uh, but I didn't want to manually create each macro and then maintain the list as the math spec changed. Uh, it's, it's a huge issue uh, in ES6 module exports. They are static and they don't allow you to loop over anything and create runtime exports. This means that the first here is possible as you're just exporting an object, but the second is not because you need to know there's a floor macro at build time but you don't know the functions on math until runtime. But where there's a will, there's a way. Um, so here's some pseudocode for how we are uh, creating these macros. Uh, the top is creating an 
object to export with all the macros as properties, which is legal in ES6. And the bottom is what we want to do. Uh, but we don't know the names of the functions or how many there are at build time. Essentially, you cannot create n number of exports, which is what we want to do. So I made a Babel plugin whose only job is to rewrite imports for you. It turns the above, which would error because the export doesn't actually exist, and it transpiles into the bottom for you. I wanted to give you the option of using the desirable API with the trade-off of, in the distant future, if we stop using Babel, I'll have to make all the experts real by copying and pasting all, all of them. Oh, good trade-off in my opinion. All right, the future of Ember Awesome macros. Road to 1.0. Um, still adding lots of macros. Um, there's lots of experiments going on in the implementation, which means possible breaking changes. Uh, we're on 0.31 right now, going strong. Possible merger with, with Ember CPM, so people don't have to choose between the two. We're in talks of doing it. And uh, there's talks of deprecating the existing macros and moving them out of core and to possibly live in this future merger of the two add-ons. All right. What if the macro you want is specific to your app and doesn't fit into a general case add-on like Ember Awesome macros? You make your own. In comes Ember Macro Helpers. It was extracted from Ember Awesome macros, and it now powers the following libraries. Ember CPM now uses it, and Moment and Computer Decorators. The main primitive it has is computed. By default, a function is no different than the existing ember.computed. It's a drop-in replacement. That is, if you aren't already using the function parameters. The parameters are often unused. They tell you which property change is responsible for the recalculation, which isn't useful in most cases. So instead of making this.get your first step when writing computer properties, you now get those values passed to you in the parameter list. This helps cut down on a lot of boilerplate code. Nice. Oh, right here. <laughs> <laughs> <Not stuff too>. <laughs> <laughs> More to come. Here we can see the computed is aware of array syntax. And while only watching what you explicitly ask, it will still provide you with the full array. Here we can see property brace expansion in effect, the underutilized feature I was referring to early, earlier. Excuse me. Uh, your expanded properties are sent to you as resolved values in the parameter list. You can see that one string key equals two values in this case. It doesn't matter. It'll do it for you. This library also comes with some detailed blueprints to help you get started writing and testing your macros. <coughs> this is what you'll see if you'll type uh, ember help generate after installing the add-on. Adding two, uh, adding two values together is the default macro that is generated for you to customize. It makes a working macro and a working macro test. It also installs the Ember Macro Test Helpers add-on for you, which provides shorthand ways to test your macros. All right, it's demo time. I don't have enough faith in the demo gods to uh, do an actual live coding because of what Nathan said. So I'm just going to go through some code and branch, <coughs> branch switching. All right. Let's walk through what it, likes, what it looks like to create your own macro.
All right, I need to push this out so I can see that screen a little bit better. Okay. So I Ember installed Ember macro helpers. And uh, first step is Ember generate macro, name of macro. In this case, it's just add um, because that's what the default implementation is for you. I'll show it to you right now. <laughs> um, so this is what you get for uh, when you, this is just the Greenfield blueprint for you. It adds two things together for you. Um, up top here uh, are your incoming keys, string keys. They could be objects, values. They could be macro trees. Uh, it, it, uh, it, you, it's only important to you at this point if you want to do something uh, complex. You want to error early if you detect something. You say, uh, you didn't give me enough arguments. Um, one of these keys is not the type I want in this case. Uh, but normally, you don't need to do any of the, this right here. It's just, um, I really like really, really commented and really verbose blueprints. So your keys go into this computed helper that comes from the base library. And out come the val resolve values. And that's this is this is your code right here. This is all you usually have to worry about. What am I going to do with those resolve values? I'm going to add them together. It's right in, right here. Let me move it down a little bit. There we go. So it adds two values together for you. Uh, it doesn't care type. It'll add two strings for you if you want. Um, and it also does read only for you to protect you. All right. Where's the mouse is always the question. All right, it's the branch switching. Oh, yep, okay. Um, let me now go to the test. Here is the default uh, test that's generated for you. It's a complete working example. Uh, you see it's using the compute helper from this macro test helpers. There's, a, there's only this helper in there right now. Um, uh, but it, it uh, shorthands basically ember object create, uh, extend. It shorthands all that for you um, and just says, give me your macro on this computed. Um, you want to provide any keys on a potential object. This would be like your component. Uh, and then an assertion key, strict equal to three, one, two, three. And now I would like to segue just briefly into what that helper does for you, all the different things you can do with this helper. Um, so this is the integration test to test the API of it. And so this is the best documentation there is. It's just everything it does. Um, you've got strict equal, you've got deep equal if you're dealing with arrays or objects. You've got an assertion function if you want to do something fancy yourself. You can assert that it's correctly read-only and not screwing that up. And these, you can, uh, these primitives, this compute primitive is promise aware. You can make a macro that's promise aware. This is all built in for you. Um, so you have to return the promise on this, this return value, and it'll wait for it. And then the last two are returning. I'll return the value. I'll return the actual object, the subject. Uh, and you can calculate the computer yourself, assert yourself. This is for the really complicated cases where the, the um, helpers aren't enough. All right, now uh, I switch my branch. All right, let's go back up to here. And then we're gonna talk about the options on this blueprint. It's a single blueprint macro. There's two different options on it. Uh, this, let's see, I'll go, I already switched it. The, the previous one was default. This one is dash dash use curried. 
Now I gotta thank Nathan for the name. Um, it, it simplifies it for you. It says, uh, the, you know those keys coming in, who cares about them? I'll hand them for you. They can give you one key that is brace expanded to three keys, uh, whatever. I'm just gonna give you the resolve values, that's all you have to worry about. So you just take those values and do your operation. This is an add macro. It's like dead simple. Most of your macros, they could, uh, you know, divide, they could do string, they could do whatever. And it's, it usually just comes to plain old JavaScript in this function. And then let me switch to another branch and it's that other option. This is uh, the use spread option. It's just an ES6 feature. Uh, it turns your parameters, your values into an array for you. Um, and so this makes it really easy to support n number of arguments in your macro. Uh, so now it's going to add five numbers for you. It's going to concat five strings for you. It doesn't care. It'll reduce it. So this, is, this might be the situation you use if you want to make a very robust macro. All right. Switch branch. With that, with that out of the way, let's look at an example of consolidated computed properties using a dependency like moment with real world example before. Here's the code that I want to clean up. You might see this in your components. Uh, you're doing a lot of redundant things. You're copy and pasting, you're changing the keys, but that's about it. Uh, you could move this to a util, but then you still have the computed everywhere. So we want to move this to a macro. So you run ember generate macro, and in this case, we're going to name it moment format. And we're going to give it the use curried option. Uh, we don't care about the keys coming in. Uh, we just get, and then since we're always using, okay, we're always using uh, just two, um, just two keys. We only have two variables in this. We're not using n number of variables. So we're not going to use the spread. We're just going to take in date and format. And you basically just copy paste your how your code works. I'm going to put that date back in a moment. I'm going to format it. Uh, and here's uh, your code afterwards. Uh, single macro, date key, and then my format string. But at this point, you're saying you want to say, uh, I don't really want to deal with that raw right there. I don't want to escape the um, the strings because without that escape, you would be looking up a property called DDDD on the actual component. You don't want that. You just want I want it to treat it as a value. And you say I want it. It's always going to be a string value. Just get it. I don't want to to deal with that raw. So. That's where um, the non curried version, where you actually mess with the keys, comes into play. Where's my cursor? There it is. So we're, now we're back to the non curried version, where you have to use the computed and you have a function out here. Uh, so those date and format at this point, they're keys, but when I pass it into computed, I'm going to do the raw translation escaping right here. Um, so what essentially I'm doing is I'm limiting the flexibility of this macro so that I don't have to do that raw escaping anymore. Um, I put the constraint that this second parameter is never going to be a macro, it's never going to be a property name, it's just going to be a string value, and then I can eliminate that raw. Now let's look at an example of consolidating macros. Here's the code beforehand. So I'm successfully using the macros. Um, I'm using one of an equal. I'm using one from the string uh, folder called to upper. And I'm just doing a string invariant compare. Uh, I don't care the casing. I just want to compare these strings. But you see that you you see that your macros are just have the same problem. They're being copy and pasted. 
So you want to bundle these all up into a new macro that you want to reuse around your app. And you call it string invariant equal. And you're using, uh, actually this is not using any of the options because it's just, it's not using that computed base. It's just copy paste macros in here, you're done. Yep. And so now it's just another macro. Long name. So you didn't actually like reduce any code, but you reduced a lot of complexity. Uh, you're never going to have a copy paste issue. Someone changed it in one spot and not the other. So that's just some uh, real world uh, examples. I can, um, I can, oh, this is going to be tough. I can do this. If I want to, that's valid. You can pose it all you want. I can do Oh boy. I hope I got that. Okay, yeah, that's valid too. You can key numbers not dependent in macros. Uh, you can expand them if you want. So just some of the few things you can do. Now they're using that nice base library. Um, so let me go back to the presentation. Here we go. And that's the end. <laughs> Here's some links. They cover major libraries I went over in this talk, and I'll post the slides on the meetup. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, Gordon. That, the add scenario we had, value one, value two. Mm -hmm. What's the right way to enforce uh, script or typing so that you're concatenating the string <coughs> to numbers, you know, so you get the right result? Is there something built into the library to kind of enforce that, or you just kind of have to dance that? Um, you can, you would need to, um, let me see if I can go back to an example where there's some code. Um, so, uh, when you're inside of that code, when you've actually resolved the values is when you do type checking. Uh, it's, I would say it's an unfortunate side effect of the fact that the key is coming in, you can't guess their type yet, because they could be macros, uh, they could be whatever. Uh, you could, if you wanted to, you could severely type limit your macro and say that these keys have to be a s string, they can't be a macro, but you, you lose a lot of composing. So if you move that type check to later, um, uh, inside when the computer is actually calculated, and then you know the actual type, you could do it in there. Uh, it would just mean you'd, you'd get uh, your feedback a lot later. There's nothing in the library to sort of check the type beforehand when this thing is a string. Well, I mean, the actual base layer does lots of type checking to see what it, if it's a macro, it does one thing. If it's a string literal, it does another thing. It, it, it has its own type checking, but not for your benefit. Yeah. Any other questions, Nathan? Uh, how does this handle uh, values that are provided by Hember Data? So if you return something from, or set a property to this.store.find, uh, it will be a promise proxy. Is Ember Computed Macros aware of that? Or Ember Awesome Macros? Ember Awesome Macros? Well, there's a macro for, there's a, there's a whole section. It's slash promise. There's about five promise aware macros in there. Uh, they're, they, they proxy for you. Uh, so, yes, it's possible. Cool. Um, how fast do they? Um, not sure. Probably a little bit slower than uh, native computer properties. Uh, 
but they aren't doing, I, I don't know, I haven't benchmarked them, but they're not doing anything too crazy. Uh, so I can't imagine they're that slow. <laughs> That's right. Any other questions? That's really cool, man. Just to understand the, the query, that's basically just wrapping that, what you pass in with the computed. Yeah, so it's doing, write that. it's taking that default that's a little more explicit and doing that above stuff for you. So you can just. It does read only for you, it does that computed for you, it just does, it does the key passing for you. It carries. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're going to take a quick break here. Um, Chris um, is going to do a total of customer.